Today we're going to be taking a look at some TypeScript tips and tricks I've picked up over the years, which are going to make your code bases more expressive, type safe, and generally blow your mind. Let's go ahead and take a look at the first one. I'm going to show you a simple example and then show you this in a real world production code base. The first one we're going to be talking about is the const keyword. Unlike the JavaScript const keyword, which is anything but constant, the TypeScript as const cast is going to give us true immutability. What I'm talking about is this. If I go ahead and do fruits.push asdf, this is completely fine. Uh, that's because const in JavaScript just means it cannot be reassigned. It doesn't mean this is actually a true constant variable like it is in pretty much every other language. I would like this to be immutable and constant, and the way you can do that is by saying as const. We're now getting a compilation error. We cannot mutate or change this array in any way, shape, or form. You can't even go ahead and add a new apple. This is the final form of the array. Uh, this is a really good feature to have. I can go ahead and do a comparison here, and it knows this is only going to be equal to apple. Uh, this is not at all limited to strings. I can go ahead and make this a little bit more complex, say a foo bar type. I can actually make it as complex as you would like. If I go ahead and say fruits2 in this case, dot foo, that can only possibly be equal to bar. Anything else gives us a compilation error. We can see this is working exactly how const probably should have worked in JavaScript. At least TypeScript is giving us the expected behavior. Uh, just to show you an example of this in a real world production code base, let's take a quick look at Cypress. Uh, the first example is over here using the React versions. Uh, right now there's two React versions here, 17 and 18, and they are declared in a constant array. This cannot be changed, and it is a very good indicator to the reader that this is going to be a, a variable value which is not going to be changed throughout the lifetime or the runtime of this program. Uh, just to show you a bit more complex example, we have this one here. We have some default values in a store. Uh, we have URL component which has some numbers and E2E which has some numbers as well. And you can see as I type, I am getting completion of height and width of 600. Uh, so const is very useful for things like options or configuration, things we know that are not going to change over the lifetime of the program. Uh, const, has, const has a few more tricks up its sleeve, which I'm going to show you right now as we move on to the next tip and trick, which I'm calling index types. I'm going to go ahead and just delete this one and show you how this one works. So I call these index types. I don't know what the correct name is. Uh, if you do, please let me know. Uh, but for the longest time before I knew about this, I might have something like testing types. I'm going to have E2E and component. And often I would want not only to have a value, but also a type definition for this same thing. And what I would basically do in that case is have uh, just the type, something like E2E and component. And I kind of have to maintain these two sources of truth throughout the application lifetime, uh, which is really not ideal. What would be really nice is if we could pick one and then derive the value from the other. We obviously can't go from TypeScript to JavaScript since at runtime, TypeScript is going to be stripped away. So what this means we need to do is start with our type and then extract this value somehow. Let's go ahead and see how that one might work. So what we want to do is grab all of these values out of the array and assign them to a type. The first thing you might try and do is something like uh, go ahead and say type of, so the type of testing types. What we can do is use an index type, or at least what I call an index type, and we're going to say we want a number. And this is going to grab us all of the entries of the array. Uh, this is pretty close, but we're actually going to get a string type here. Uh, and that's because of what we talked about earlier with JavaScript and immutability. Although this is currently E2E and component, it can often change, for example, by pushing a new value in here. We need to make sure this one is constant, so TypeScript can correctly derive the value. Now we're getting the correct value, E2E and component. The reason this works is, of course, because this is immutable, so TypeScript can then infer that number can only refer to E2E or component. Again, if you know the correct name for this type of uh, type, please let me know. Uh, but for now, I'm going to call it index types, since we're indexing the type of an array. Uh, and this is very useful. So the next thing we're going to do is move on to our third type, which is actually a mix of types. And that is going to be these very cool utility types. So what I have here is a function, uh, it returns a promise, and that is going to resolve a value of foo. TypeScript gives us a number of utility types to make it easier to represent uh, different types of values. Uh, so what I want to talk about in this case is how we can go ahead and extract this foo value here. This is a very contrived example, but a very uh, practical example of this is when third parties uh, do not expose their types. You can use the following utility types to extract the types that you want. So what we're going to do is try and make a type to extract out foo. There's actually two different types we can use here. I'm going to go ahead and create one. We can say awaited, and this is going to allow us to get an awaited value. In this case, we want the awaited value of this p function. So we need to go ahead and grab the return type, the return type referring to this promise, and then we need to go ahead and put in the value, so type of p. This is going to say I want to await for the return type of this inner value. 
So the return type of the promise that is returned from the P function. Uh, it's a bit of a mouthful, but that is how it works. And if we did everything correctly, this is indeed going to be foo. We're using two utility types here, awaited and return type. Uh, so awaited is a quite a recent addition to TypeScript. This didn't always exist, uh, but you could always build it from existing types. Let me show you how to do that one as well. I'm going to create my own awaited, which does exactly the same thing. And this is going to give us an opportunity to explore some other neat TypeScript tips and tricks. We're going to have a new type here called awaited, which is going to be generic type, taking in a value. And what we're going to see, do is see if this can extend or if it is equal to a promise. Let's go ahead and say promise. If it is, we're going to go ahead and infer the value. So infer u. Extend here is basically like an equal or seeing if something is equal. Uh, so we're saying if t is a promise, we're then going to use infer, which is kind of like declaring a variable, but for types. So we're declaring a u, which is going to extract out the returned value of this promise or the resolved value. So if this is a promise, we're going to go ahead and return awaited. We're going to recurse and pass in that u value. Otherwise, we're going to go ahead and return t. Uh, this does look like a bit of a mess, which is why they gave us the awaited keyword. But let me explain how this one works. Let's go ahead and just work our way through it. We're going to re receive t here, which is going to be the return type of this p value, which is indeed going to be a promise. Because t does indeed extend promise, or it is a promise, we're going to go ahead and grab that resolved value, u, which is going to be foo. And then we're going to call awaited, getting this, passing in the u value. We come back here, receiving foo, and then because this is not going to extend promise, foo does not extend promise, we're just going to go ahead and return foo, giving us our value. Uh, so writing these kind of recursive types is a little bit confusing, but uh, you do a bit of practice and you will get the hang of it. I'll leave some resources in the description. Either way, what I really wanted to talk about was the different kinds of utility types we have. We have return type and awaited, and there's a whole bunch more which I'm going to talk about right now in the final tip. And that is going to be using these couple of different utility types, pick and omit, as well as exclude and extract. So I probably use pick and omit the most often, and I'm going to show you this example right here. Let's say we have a user type with uh, ID, username, and password. This is very useful. For example, we're creating a user form. Maybe a better way to do this would be something like a user form with a username and a password. We then might want to construct a new type using this one as the base. So I'm going to create a new one, let's say auth user, and that's going to be equal to a user form, but it's going to be slightly different. First thing we're going to do is say pick, and we're going to pick out a type. We're going to pick it out from the user form type, I'd like to go ahead and grab the username. I don't want the password. I could then go and extend it as well, passing in something like some other value or string. The main thing I'm saying here is we can use pick to grab out values. An alternative would be to use omit. We could go ahead and say omit and then omit the password value. And this is going to give us exactly the same thing. You can see we're getting a thing here with just the username. Again, just to prove this does work, we can use pick, which is the opposite. And in this case, we're going to pick out the username variable and we get the same result. So pick is very useful when you want a couple of values from a large or a couple of types from a large type and omit is the opposite. You want a couple of types from a large type uh, or rather you would like to exclude a couple of different types. Uh, they kind of come in uh, inverses here. We have exactly the same thing down here with exclude and extract. Uh, these are a bit more complex, but they are very useful and I'm going to show you a real world example of this one right now. We're heading over again to Cypress. Uh, Dev tools are a good example of these more complex types. And we're going to take a look at this one over here inside of dev server. We have a framework type here and we are using extract. The way this works is you pass in an object or an, a type definition usually for an object, in this case, the dev server configuration option. And we're going to extract out anything here that matches this value here, bundler webpack. So we're saying I'd like to extract out all dev server configs that use webpack as the bundler. We're then going to use this uh, type or this mapped type and grab out the framework. So now we're going to have a list of frameworks extracted from this original type that use Webpack as the bundler. We're then going to use exclude. So we're using the opposite of extract. Uh, at least that's how I kind of think about it. We're going to say all frameworks excluding Angular that use Webpack. So maybe create React app and the Vue CLI, for example. Uh, we're then going to go, out, go ahead and continue extending this type. We are going to use Angular after all, but we're going to extend this one with a more uh, expressive type definition of the Angular dev server project config. So you can see we've used extract and exclude to take an existing type and to narrow it down and can kind of make it more malleable to give it exactly what we want. This is our single source of truth and we're using these utility types to construct more expressive types for our end users. 
Uh, that's all I've got for you today. I hope these were useful for you. And if you'd like to learn more, I would recommend looking at complex code bases such as VS Code or Cypress. Just go ahead and do a search for whatever you like, maybe omit or exclude, and just go ahead and take a look at how they're doing things in here. Uh, there's a lot of really good stuff here and definitely a good way to learn is by looking at large complex code bases. Either way, that's all I've got and I will see you in the next video.